I grew up in Berwick-on-Tweed, which is two miles away from the Scottish border on the coast of Northumberland. So it's, it's the furthest north you can go in England before it turns into Scotland, and it's by the sea. I grew up in a hotel. My parents were, had hotels. Um, so I grew up in quite a small, you could call it a country hotel, but a small town hotel when you had about a dozen rooms and a bar and a restaurant. Um, but the road itself, was quite, it was in the town and it was quite a busy thoroughfare at that point when I was growing up because there was a, a shipyard just at the end of the road and all the ship, shipyard workers used to come into the pub after work and at lunchtime and there was a cinema right opposite and so I kind of had all of the crowds coming in and out of that. Um, so it was quite a, you know, it's called Sandgate, the road, and it was kind of just quite a sort of a nice kind of busy, you know, it, now it's not all of those things have gone. The hotel has closed down, the, uh, the cinema has been knocked down, and this, the um, shipyard closed years ago, so it's not quite the same road as it was. I think everyone was very set in their own places, you know what I mean? It, I grew up in a time where there still was that kind of quite stratified, you know, class system and whether I'm not sure that I think people kind of generally were happy with their own lot and I, I mean, my, I was just saying that, I mean my parents kind of I think rose up through from sort of working class backgrounds through middle class and then sent, you know, worked and sent us to school so it was that but I'm not sure that as within the town there was like I think the only aspiration that most people I knew growing up as kids was to leave town and get away from it because industries were dying and, you know, and much as I love and talk about loving, you know, loving the place, certainly for young people there's, there's, you know, there was bugger all there to, to do and you know, there wasn't any nightlife or anything like that so I think most people kind of aspire to, to get away from it couldn't wait to get away obviously you know as you as you are when you're kind of you know a teenager um but it's always kind of remained home to me and you know and kind of as a grow older more so really I kind of feel a very strong affinity with the place when I'm there it's, it still feels although London is my home it still feels like another home mm. I don't feel like I'm a visitor it is almost exclusively white. I think there was there was one Chinese family as I was growing up because they had the local Chinese restaurant, and there was an Asian corner shop, and I think that was it. There was no you know you didn't see any black faces or anything, and I think I don't know. I, don't, I mean it's difficult to know where my my kind of tastes in 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 that direction came from, but certainly wasn't, maybe it was just a reaction to being somewhere so white. I mean, even when I go back, I mean, it's slightly more mixed now, but it's not very much more, to be honest. And I think that's the one thing I, you know, I often sort of daydream about moving back there and living there, but that's the one thing that kind of slightly puts me off, is just the, the sort of lack of non-white faces, you know, mm. it's very white. Mm. And the Northumbrians are not the prettiest of people. <laughs> <laughs> I include myself in that part. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> I think it's outstandingly beautiful as a as a town. It's it's a wall. It's got a, got an Elizabethan wall all the way around it, which um, very big, thick wall, and it's by the sea and it's on the river and it's got three bridges that go. Up. And so it's kind of a very picturesque, beautiful place. And I think I think its beauty is as much important to me as, as anything else you know I'm always I never get bored with walking around it I'm not sure my own aesthetic is I don't know if, if it's totally informed by the look and feel of Berwick the wall that surrounds Berwick is it's very encompassing it's very it makes you feel very safe and it's got, it's got a solidity to it and I think that there's something about that that I like and, and that, that that has, I think there's something kind of quite solid about the work that I do. I feel it's kind of quite definite things. So maybe that, but um, no, I think generally, I don't think, you know, I think it's other things that have informed my, my aesthetic rather than the place. Having grown up in a hotel, as I said, although I had a, you know, 
very loving family, a kind of pretty idyllic childhood. We never had our own rooms and things. We kind of just had to stay where, wherever a room was free that night. So, so I guess that there's always been a kind of search for something a bit more secure and, and permanent. Things. And so I think there's this kind of resonance of, of the walls sort of being that, and then, and then kind of being this sort of itinerant child, you know, hopping from room to room and things. I guess that also comes from my, life, my sort of love of comic strips and cartoons and that sort of thing as well, because, you know, I like things with borders around them, as it were, so. Mm. But then, you know, also, as a counterbalance to that, Berwick is on a border, you know, so it's between England and Scotland. And I do like the fact that things merge or kind of contrast as well, you know, so I, I think that comes into my work a bit as well, mm. the kind of um, crossing borders and melding of cultures and that sort of thing. Because mm. Berwick really is neither English nor Scottish. It's kind of, you know, it's a bit of both. Berwick is like an island, really, and I mean, I guess a lot of people say wherever they come from is like that, but it, it really is because, well, obviously, if you did a circle around, I mean, 50% is water, and then the others is kind of sheep and grass. You know what I mean? It's for, a, for about 50 miles around, it's not, you know, until, you know, 50 miles north is Edinburgh, 50 miles south is Newcastle, and then the other way, there's nothing. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's pretty isolated. Yeah, so it doesn't, although it is, obviously, it falls in the northeast. It, I don't think it has much to do with a lot of those northeastern cities and larger towns. Really, it's mm -hmm. its own thing. I'm kind of um, post-rationalising a few things here, but I mean, you know, it, certainly within Berwick, there is that kind of cross-pollination of English and Scottish. You know, whether it be, as I said, the language or architecture or whatever. So you get bits and pieces of all, and they kind of melt together and make its own thing. And that, I guess that has, a, you know, uh, has maybe informed some of how I approach work and things. Mm -hmm. So although I say I like definite things, I also like the kind of the mixing of things as well. But you know, if you mix them, I like them to be a definite thing in their own way. Also, I come from that era of, you know, magpie borrowing, you know, postmodern whatever. You mm -hmm. know, so I think that's as much to do with it as being from the border. My work is quite sort of vivid generally, but quite bright and vivid and you know about you know, pop references and, and you know black guys and whatever. My personal life is a lot more, you know I like solitude, I'm kind of a quite, quite a quiet person generally um, and I think that's from coming from somewhere like that you know Silence and solitude don't kind of scare me. You know, I'm quite happy to be on my own. And that's because I grew up in a place that was, you know, I mean, you know, obviously I had friends and what have you, but, you know, I, it, it's not like living, coming from a city. Because, because I often think that the masculinity that I might try and project in my work is probably the one that I'm attracted to. So it's, it's, it's less about trying to portray, you know, the North or men or whatever. It's just about what I find attractive, mm. generally. I mean, I see, I'm, I'm just thinking, if I'd grown up in Tunbridge Wells, would I, have, would I have a different aesthetic or would I still, you know, I still find the same kind of guys attractive? I don't know. Mm. It's a hard one, really. Again, kind of, I think anyone growing up by the sea has to be influenced by or drawn to it, I, I, I'm sure. But I mean, I feel a very strong resonance when I go back and, and I'm next to the sea. I feel like I'm, that, more than anything, makes me feel like I'm coming home, almost kind of viscerally. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's a very strong feeling. And I, I really, you know, I could quite happily sit for hours just, you know, looking at the sea or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an important part of me. And, that, and that's the thing I've missed most living in London is, is being near the sea mm. and occasionally you know get down to the the south coast or even over to Kent or whatever um, but somehow the sea is not the same there it seems bigger and the skies are bigger I think it's just somehow it's it's the expanse and obviously it's just the light and the colour I think it's just somehow it's it feels 
older and more raw somehow. Miss Dixon was my best friend. Uh, I, I met her. She she lived in a house next to our hotel. She must. Have, I mean, I met her when I was probably about six or seven, and she was in her mid sixties by then. And she had been the manageress of the cinema, the one that I said was opposite our hotel. And she lived alone. She'd always she'd she'd never married. She would lived with her mother until her mother had died, probably five or six years before I met her. Um, and she had lived in this very tall house, had about six, six floors, and she'd collected things all her life, just antiques, and she had huge kind of like expanses. I mean, every room was filled with candles, fabulous candles, and huge kind of colour blocking and, and kind of, um, you know, she had a massive uh, sideboard, but was kind of, Dozens and dozens of different candles of different um, different colours of purple or white or whatever. In every room was different, uh, and all these um, kind of colour scapes and lots and lots of plastic flowers, but really not crap ones. Really beautiful kind of displays, and just lots of stuff. But but well thought through, ed edited. It wasn't she wasn't like a hoarder next door. She was like she just liked nice things, and I think she she never had children, obviously. She was quite religious, she was Catholic, and it was just, it was just a fascinating place to, to kind of grow up and, and uh, explore. And she had let me have you know, free reign in the house, and I just used to spend days kind of going through cupboards and whatever. It was, just, it was just magical. I think she was quite lonely after her mother had died, and I was kind of, a lot, I mean, you know, it makes me sound like some sort of, um, you know, outsider, but I mean, I, was, you know, I had plenty of friends. It wasn't like I was, um, but, my parents were very, always very busy in the hotel, and my brother and sister are quite a lot older than I am. So I kind of had, you know, I was left on my own quite a lot just to kind of explore and things as, as kids were in those days. Um, and I just kind of fell into kind of chatting to her and things, and then we just kind of became good buddies. And, uh, and it, was, it was really a really enjoyable, you know, having some, that, you know, I mean, because obviously a large difference in age, but it was a, a really great um, friend to have at that point. We talked about a lot. I mean, she, she I think she got me interested. I mean, she, you know, she, yeah, she got me interested in all sorts of things. So she had masses of books and things. And, you know, we used to talk about history or, you know, religion or art or whatever. Not in any majorly intellectual way, but, you know, she just kind of, you know, we looked through books and talked about things. She was a very, you know, she was a very quite a well-read woman, and just she was just a bit different from other people locally. You know, she just a, had her own mind. So you know, it was, it was, um, no, it was a very, and I think going back to what we were saying about what informs your aesthetic, I think that and, and being around her and her things more than anything has informed my own aesthetic. Certainly, when it comes to my personal taste of things in the home or whatever because I'm also a bit of a not a collector but I like I, I like a lot of things around and I like arranging them I've got a lot of toast tracks but that, although they've kind of they've been usurped now by my um I've got a whole I'm, I'm into kind of different china I'm kind of making a very colorful china tea service at the moment <laughs> she did all of these things but her image mean, didn't have that many visitors and I think the fact that I was quite fascinated kind of helped, and so I think I was kind of quite a good captive audience for her. And now looking back, you know, my my mum thinks sort of sort of joke about it, but perhaps you know, perhaps not all of her history or the stories she told were one hundred percent true. But that's fine. You know, I mean, you know, she was allowed to embellish things. You know, but she was a fascinating woman. You know, she and she she you know she'd been managers of the cinema in cinema's golden age, you know, from the sort of 20s onwards and things, and it, you know, when it was really quite a glamorous place to be, and so, you know, I used to hear all about that. Well, the plastic flowers, each window had a huge kind of vase or something with this big display. Each window had a separate display of flowers in it. And then once a year, we'd have to go around each one and, and wash them all individually. We'd go around with a washing up bowl and kind of wash all the flowers, and then the ones that had faded, we had to repaint with, with, 
<laughs> with watercolours and things to make just to make sure that they're so that was really quite you know um, but I mean there was so much stuff in there it was just I'm trying to think of anything I, it was just all oh, I tell you actually thinking no I just jogged my memory but she had a she had masses of I'm not sure she must have just collected them she had masses of Sunday Times colour supplements in her attic and she must have just whenever she got the Sunday Times she'd just, and I th- I've actually never thought about that to now, but I used to pour through these colour supplements and things, and it was fascinating. So maybe that was a very early part of getting into photography and, and imagery and things, because I remember being absolutely fascinated by them. I've never thought about that, actually. She was immaculate. She looked almost exactly like the Queen Mother. I mean, uncannily so. And kind of, I think, she played up to that, so she sort of dressed in all one colour outfits and she was never, I never saw her once, you know, out of costume as it were. She always was Im- impeccably dressed and when she went to church she always had a matching hat and things and she had like dozens and dozens of hats, all different colours and things. So, yeah, and she was quite, she was sort of quite imperious and quite grand and things, but, um, you know, and so yeah, clothes were very important to her, yeah, but in a kind of, you know, in a kind of matronly kind of way as well. She wasn't. Uh, a glamorous granny or anything like that. Yeah. Growing up in a hotel, I guess you know, it's, it it's quite a th- in in many ways it's quite a theatrical kind of environment because you you know you're having to perform and be nice to to guests and things and to create a great environment for them. So uh, and then it was you know obviously they're only there for however many nights or even one, whatever. So there's constantly this different, you know, um, I'm trying to think the right word, you know, but there were always different people coming through. Um, and that, I guess that was kind of, that was exciting, you know, because you were never kind of bored. There was always someone interested. I think my parents were kind of good hoteliers, you know, so they, they knew how to, you know, butter up or flirt or whatever, you know, with the, the clients, whatever, you know, so yeah, it was a, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think if that's really informed anything. I think I'm probably not as good as a performer as, as they were or would have been. I mean, I, you know, I, I, certain people are really great on set and can, you know, keep it going. I'm not sure, in the way, I'm, I don't think I'd ever be a great photographer because they really have to be the kind of ringmaster. I tend to kind of be a bit more kind of getting on with my own thing and then ta-da, do you know what I mean? But it's not, I'm, I'm fine kind of, say, with the model or an assistant or whatever. I'm not sure I've got that ability to keep everyone up and going, you know, which my parents had. And I think most good photographers I know have got that ability. I have a real flying phobia and I have to fly quite a lot. And often I've been to see like um, hypnotherapists things, and they sort of say, try and go back to your best time, your best day. And this is where, where I was kind of end up going back to. And it was around about, it must have been about 81, I think. I was, I was still at college in London, and I'd gone back up for the summer, um, uh, or at least for a few weeks in the summer. And so my mum had driven down the coast from Berwick, down to, she was visiting a friend who lived on a farm almost at, almost at um, Holy Island, Linda's Farm, which is just down the coast from Berwick. Uh, and so I said, well, can you drop me and I'll walk back, which is about, it was about 10 miles or something. And I thought, I'll give it a go. Um, anyway, it was, it was a beautiful summer's day. It was really warm. And, uh, and I just walked back along the dunes and along the sand. And I'd, I had my recently bought Sony Walkman, which was kind of, you know, quite new at the time, I mean, for everyone. And I'd made a mixtape, and it was just, just fabulous. And it was just, it was just, a, I think it was just kind of, I felt, I felt really kind of, I, mean, I was kind of aware of my youth, which is kind of a rare thing to, you know, when you're, when you're actually living it. But I felt very, on that day, I felt very aware of my youth, I felt very kind of, just everything was right. It just felt like perfect, you know. And I, would, I hardly saw anyone because the beaches there are enormous and very, you know, um, very quiet. So you know, I just walked along the sands, listened to music, looking at the sea, the sun on, and it was just it was fabulous. 
I think the, possibly the most northern part of me, if, if, to use that expression, is maybe my humour. In that I'm kind, I, well, I like to think I have a sense of humour, <laughs> and I'm quite sort of bluff and a bit sort of, you know, um, can be a bit rude with it. Things, and I think maybe that more than anything is 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 the thing that's endured and what I kind of use in my way of dealing with people or whatever. So I would say that more than anything. Um, but I'm not, I'm not very conscious of, you, you know, I don't, I, I'm not like sort of a professional northern. I don't kind of go on about it. Well, you know, a lot of people might not even know I'm from the north, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I mean, I've, I think I've got a bit of an accent, but it's not particularly strong, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so um, I don't, you know, I'm not sort of, you know, using that in every day to sort of say, you know, you soft southerners or whatever, you know, it's like, it's just, it's just part of who I am. <laughs>